earliest I remember is probably about four or five years old, um, where my mother um, was accusing my father of um, having another woman in his life. And um, so it was a really bitter, angry divorce. My mother took my younger brother and I stayed with my dad. Um, and I loved my dad. My dad was like the neighborhood hero. And then my dad got a new girlfriend. Um, it was the girlfriend that my mom had accused him of. Uh, she had kids um, from a previous marriage. And that's really when I started acting out a lot out of jealousy. Life really deteriorated fast when my dad's attention um, was pulled away from me. So my dad would start sending me off to my mom. I'd be with my mom for a little while, but my behavior was so bad that she'd send me back. I was smoking regularly. I was beating up the stepbrothers very regularly. I um, was uh, physical with my stepmother. I was um, caught selling drugs in school at 14 and incarcerated. Um, as soon as I got out from uh, juvenile hall, um, I went into a long-term uh, rehab. Um, and it was just a cycle of uh, jails and institutions. The drugs went from um, pot and alcohol to pot, alcohol, and cocaine. And then um, as I grew older, um, it went from smoking to shooting. And uh, my brother just lit, you know, he, he cruised underneath the radar. And as long as he didn't get in any trouble, he shined. All the holes in the walls were from me. Every court date was mine, you know what I mean? Every cop that showed up at the door was because of me. Every rehab bill was mine, you know what I mean? All the drugs, they were mine. All that was true, you know, but it really stemmed from where my life and my heart fell apart at six or whatever I was in the divorce. So what happened to that guy? Uh, every week we have uh, men and women who stand down here as part of our pastoral support team. Tommy is now one of those people here in this church. Amen. <laughs> we also have several recovery homes here at the church, Rock Recovery. He runs one of those homes. He was on heroin and now he oversees one of those homes. He started himself, so let's give him a hand for that as well. Uh, he, I know Tommy very, very well. He's an inspiration in my life. I always give him a rub on his head whenever I see him. Uh, God has a way of taking people who have been led astray for whatever reason, and no matter how far astray they have gone, God has a way of taking those people and getting them back to where they're supposed to be and using them in a very powerful way. And no matter where you are and where you've strayed or what, happened, what you've done, what has been done to you, God is in the life transforming business. It is very important for us to always remember and acknowledge that church is not about coming to a building on Sunday and hearing someone talk and then feeling I checked the box. Christianity is not about a church service. It's about a relationship with a person, Jesus. And that, that relationship is transforming. And it's not where you get saved and you stop doing one thing and that's it. Your whole life is a transforming process. Amen. It's very important to understand. So when you come to church or when you go to community group, which we've been encouraging you to go, you read your Bible, you pray, you watch a program or whatever, it's all about how can this help me be transformed more into the image of Christ. And that transforming process lasts until the day you die. So the work that God has began, began in you, he will complete it and be completing it until the day of Christ, until the day you die anyway. And so we want to give you that hope today as we continue our series called Family Origin. We're talking about the scapegoat child, the child that always is in trouble. And we want to encourage you that God has a very powerful plan for you. Now, before I start, I want to say a word of prayer. Um, I don't know if you heard this week, we had two police officers, sheriff uh, officers who were shot here in San Diego, uh, one Craig Johnson who's now out of the hospital, and Ali Perez who's still in the hospital who's part of our church family. And so we want to pray for his family and pray for him. And as we pray, I, I want to encourage you, if you see a police officer, someone from the sheriff's um, firefighter, a paramedic, these are the people, no matter what, how you view them or whatever, 
When you call 911, you want them there quick. And no matter what your experience was in the past, when you need them, and usually when you need them, it's in a very desperate situation, you want them there, you want them to be able to do their job. They lay their life down, on, 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 their life on the line for us. And so I, I want to encourage you before we pray, if you see a police officer or a firefighter or whatever, just go home and say thank you. If you go to a police officer, make sure you make your hands visible. Don't walk up to the police office like this with your hand in your jacket, okay? Don't do that. Just go, how you doing, officer? I want to pray for you. Don't be trying to lay hands on them. Just pray from a distance. <laughs> Tell them thank you. For real. Just say thank you for what they do. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for our police officers, our law enforcement officers our firefighters, our paramedics. We pray you protect them. We pray you bless them. We pray for Ali Perez that you heal him, give the doctors and nurses wisdom on how to care for him. Thank you for all the people from the Rock that work at that hospital that are caring for him even now. Pray for his family, his wife and kids and relatives that you protect their heart and comfort them, that your peace would rest on their hearts as they go through this difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's see your Bibles today. Let's see your Bibles today. Okay, that was, that was, that was, that was kind of, one more time, say word. Let's see your pens. Lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to Mark chapter 5. I want to say hello to everybody watching in North County. God bless y'all in North County. Everybody watching online, what's happening? Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. The series called Family Origin, we've been talking about the four roles children assume or take on in dysfunctional family. Most families, and I say most, more than 50% of families it's more like 85% have some sort of dysfunction, from mild dysfunction to extreme. We're all sinners, so there's no perfect family, so there's always some issue. And because all humans have a need to have their own identity, to have their own indiv sense of individuality, they have to learn how to express feelings, how to learn to relate to each other, how to learn to receive and give love, be intimate. Because all humans have that, the family is the place where you learn that. You don't, you, you, you're going to learn it one way or another, good or bad, but you're not not going to learn it. But how you learn to view yourself, others, relationships, love, how you learn to express feelings is going to be established when you're a little kid by your family and the experiences you have as a child. And if you learn them in a warped way, you will carry those those perceptions throughout your life unless you learn something different. Unfortunately, dysfunction has a way of trapping us in a rut of repeatable behavior. And usually there are four roles in general that children assume in a dysfunctional family. The first child, the oldest child, usually, not always, is the hero child or the child who's driven to succeed and has all the love and attention from the parents to succeed and they... they they're successful A's, athlete, prom queen, whatever. They're the star child of the family, and they make the child, the family look good. We talked about that last week. Nothing wrong being successful, nothing wrong getting A's, but if you are driven by this sense that if I succeed, I am loved. If I'm not succeed, I'm not loved, that's a bad motivation. And you will live that way the rest of your life. We looked at it last week. And you will try to always be first, always try to uh, succeed and, and, and get more and more and more because you think that's what creates value in you when in fact it doesn't. You should be lovable just because. The second child, usually but not always, is a scapegoat child. And that's the child that they soon learn that their brother or sister is the perfect child in their mind. And there's no room for them to be the perfect child. Matter of fact, they get often told, why can't you be like your brother or sister? And they will often unconsciously assume the child of a scapegoat 
where they will get in trouble. Now, it doesn't mean that every child that gets in trouble is a scapegoat. It doesn't mean every child who's first is the hero child. It doesn't mean that every child that's good has some dysfunction. But if your motivation is, you know what, I can't be the older child, I can't be like my brother or sister, and I'm tired of them telling me I'm not like that, and I know I can't be like that, so what I'm going to do unconsciously, may not be conscious, they end up getting in trouble and rebelling. And once that kid gets on a cycle of rebelling and that becomes familiar with them, that's what they they continue to do. And by the way, if it's familiar, you'll do it the rest of your life, potentially. A lot of people in jail, a lot of people walking the street, prostituting, whatever, some of those kids started when they were little. And so we're going to look at this story in the Bible. Now, I want to be clear when I read this story. This story is about a demon-possessed person. I am not at all implying in any shape that if you are a dysfunctional child of any kind that you are demon-possessed. <laughs> now, it is possible that you could be demon-possessed. <laughs> but that's between you and God. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're not demon-possessed. But it, I mean, you may be demon-possessed. But it has nothing, it has nothing to do with this. Me. I'm not saying this is you. But what I am going to say with the story in Mark chapter 5 is that the characteristics that we see in this demon-possessed person are similar to this extent, is that scapegoat people, children, are self-destructive. Doesn't mean every self-destructive person is a scapegoat. Okay? But, but uh, scapegoat children are self-destructive. And so we're going to see some interesting things about a self-destructive person and what God can do. By the way, there are things that only God can do. The reason the Bible is valuable, the reason Jesus is valuable, the reason Christianity is what it is as far as being uh, a one-of-a-kind faith, unlike every other religion and cult and belief in the world, is that it's a faith based on grace where you can't earn it or pay it back, and it is God living in you, and by way of God living in you, you are transformed. God is in the life transforming business. He wants to change you. Okay, so when you read the story, you hear about this self-destructive person, you may be saying, you know, man, I, I've been in trouble, I've been in jail, I've been this, I've been this, I've been this. Okay, that's why we played that story for you, a guy who was on heroin. He didn't say the word heroin, but that's what he was shooting up. And did all the stuff he said he did, and now he's a very productive person, not only in society, but in the kingdom of God. Just the highest standard. And so we just want you to get that, man, if this guy, if God can do that to this guy, he can do it to me. Okay, so let's read. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one combined him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with chains and shackles, and the chains had been broken, pulled apart, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. Okay, very simple. There's a guy we're going to learn later has a legion, a bunch of demons in him, and he is chained up. He's living in tombs with dead people. He's cutting himself, as you're going to see in a minute, breaking chains. He, and in another version of this story, in another gospel, he's running around naked. He's just out of control. Okay, I'm not saying this is you. Matter of fact, you probably don't know anybody like this. Maybe. So if God can do it for this brother, <laughs> there's hope for you, okay? Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. In verse 5, always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus saw him from afar, he ran away and he ran up to him and worshiped. Now, what I'm getting ready to tell you is a whole nother sermon, but I want you to notice three things the demon does, not the man who's possessed. Jesus is going to talk to the demon in him. The demon is going to worship Jesus, the demon is going to acknowledge Jesus to be son of God, and the demon is going to acknowledge that Jesus is the one who's going to judge us. Why is this important? Because demons will tell you, don't worship Christ as God, don't worship him, and there is no hell. But yet the demon himself is going to admit those three things right here. Again, that's another sermon. I'm just throwing it in for free as like a little uh, fortune cookie thing, okay? Just a little fortune cookie. It's not part of the meal, okay? Okay. So look what it says in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? This ain't the demon possessed person. He's using his voice. And Jesus said, and he says, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Why? The demons know their time is coming. They know that. And then he says, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He's talking to the demon. And he says, What is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. There were many demons in this guy. So Jesus is having this conversation with this demon-possessed man. 
Now, make a long story short, he cast the demons out. All the demons go into the pigs that were on the hill. The pigs run off into the water. That's kind of not relevant to the story. But look at verse 15. We're going to get down to what happened to the guy. Then it says, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and who had the legion. He was sitting clothed, because he was naked, in his right mind, and they were afraid. Why were they afraid? Here's this guy, demon possessed. No one can control him. He's in the mountains. Ah! All night they can hear him cutting himself, making noise. He lived with dead people. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks up, and they're like, the pigs are off the hill, and they, and they see the guy just sitting there chilling. <laughs> chilling is an urban term that means relaxing, kind of cooling out, kicking back. Just, just one. Let you know. Then it says, verse 16, those who had told him what had happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine, and they began to plead with him to depart from the region. They wanted Jesus to leave because Jesus sent the pigs off the hill and the pigs were their livelihood. Verse 18, when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him. He said no. But he did say, go home, tell your friends what great things the Lord has done for you. I am the Lord. He's admitting one, once again in the Bible, he's, he's admitting he's God. And how he had compassion on you. And then it says in verse 20, he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And they all marveled. Now, uh, look at your notes because we just want to break down a little bit about the scapegoat child. Right at the top of your notes, there are four different children that come out of a dysfunctional family. One is the hero, the super kid. We talked about that last week. If you're an overachiever and you are driven to succeed and, and achieve, boom, 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 you may be a hero child. We could get the sermon from last week. Today's scapegoat. Next week we're going to talk about the loner kid, the kid that flies under the radar and, doesn't, and never gets in trouble. You know, goody two-shoes. Okay, there's a reason. There's, there's several reasons why people are goody two-shoes. This is one of them. And then the mascot child, the class clown, the family cloud. But Luke says in A, what the scapegoat looks like on the outside, hostility, defiance, withdrawn, troublemaker, gets negative attention. People will gravitate to what is familiar, even if what, even if what is familiar is painful. The reason people repeat painful behavior, women who go back to abusive husbands and boyfriends, people who go back to prison, it's one of the reasons it's familiar. It's all I know. Reason people gossip constantly. It's familiar. It's their way of feeling good about themselves. It's the most, to them, the way they have found I can feel good about myself by pulling other people down because I feel below them. You can't pull someone down unless you feel below them. And you feel a need to be above them. All that going on in your head. Okay? B, what the scapegoat feels on the inside is they feel abandoned, they feel rejection, uh, inadequate, low self-esteem, black sheep of the family, don't fit in, unlovable, inadequate. Now, <laughs> uh, we probably all, and I can't speak for all of y'all, but a lot of us in here have felt that at times. In the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement was a day when the high priest in the, in, in the Israel nation in Israel, and they, they, when they, in the Old Testament, it was established in the Old Testament, where God said the high priest on this particular day would make atonement for all the sins of Israel. In other words, he would perform a ceremony and all the sins of the nation would be forgiven. And one of the parts of the ceremony is that he would take a goat and he would place his hands on the head of the goat and transfer all the sins, metaphorically, all the sins of the nation of Israel on to the goat, and then they would send the goat out into the wilderness. He was the scapegoat. That's where it comes from. And so he would pray every year. They take the scapegoat, and they pray, and, they, and, they, and this is part of the bigger ceremony, and they, and they transfer all the sins onto the head of the goat, and the goat would go into the wilderness to wander in the middle of nowhere. Jesus was our scapegoat. When he was on the cross, all our sins were transferred to him. He's our scapegoat. Unfortunately, in families, sometimes there's a kid who's the scapegoat of the family. The kid is the source of all their pain or, or the receptacle of all their pain and a distraction from all the pain in the family. And the parents will say, I don't know why that kid. As a matter of fact, let's keep reading. Look at what it says in your, in your notes. Let's see. What the scapegoat means to the family? He expresses or she expresses the hurt of the family. 
It's the kid who everyone wishes was better. Sometimes dealing with their pain unifies the family. They become the blame or the scapegoat of the family's drama. Last week we said that sometimes parents who at times feel inadequate or like they failed will say, look at my good kid, I'm not a bad parent. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying, look at my good kid. But if your motivation is to distract people from your own inadequacies, or at least in your mind, that's a lot of pressure to put on that kid. And if you feel driven to push your kid to do something good, you know, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be this, be, be successful, go, 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 it may be because that's really about you, not them. Which is unfair to them. Another issue. Scapegoat kid, I don't know why they do that. We did everything right as a parent. I don't know why they do that. Look at our other kid. The other kid's fine, so we must have done something right. Well, let me tell you something. I got three kids, and there's no way I treat them all the same. You got more than one kid, there's no way you can treat two people the same. You just can't. Two, pe- two people are two different people. They eat their food differently. They wear different clothes. They, may, they sleep, may sleep in different beds, different bedrooms, whatever it is. Their life is different. You, will not, you cannot treat two people the same ever. It's impossible because two people are not the same. You can say hi to one, hi. The other one, uh, they're not, that's not the same. We, we used to have, you know, when kids say whatever, we used to have no rule in the house, you can't say whatever. So we would say to some of our kids, they say whatever, time out, you can't say whatever. Now one kid, tell them once, they, they never say it again. The other kid, oh, I'm gonna say whatever every day. I'm gonna make them correct me every day. One kid's room was neat, another kid's room was a bomb. Matter of fact, we, so, we got so tired of telling our daughter to, close, to, to clean her room because we realized it was just not going to happen. For real, it wasn't, there was no way she had the, the capability of cleaning her room. Is anybody like that? You just can't do it. I mean, you just, I, I don't know, what, where do I put the cover to the, to the bed? How about on top of the bed? It just doesn't happen. So we, and our other daughter was like, you don't have to tell her. So we would tell our daughter who couldn't, who, who was messy. And again, she's an artist. Okay, so artists are just kind of, <laughs> there's no order. Okay, and a good artist will take disorder and make it valuable. And a bad artist is just disorder. So she was, she was that. She was that. And her room, that was her room. So we just said, look, here's what we're going to do. Just close your door. <laughs> Without help, a scapegoat child is going to be an addict, in prison, always in trouble. You go to, go to prison and you'll meet a bunch of scapegoat kids. Now, some people, and, 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 and I'll encourage you, because you may be in this rut of just trouble, always drama, never can get out of it. Some people need to get professional help for what's going on in here. Please go do it. Call the church. Ask to speak to one of our pastors or people who, who can talk to you about you, your life. But you can't do it by yourself. We weren't designed to live by ourselves as humans. If you watch Discovery Channel, you will see animals that will be born and they'll never see their parents. Turtle will come up on the beach, (laughs) dig a hole all night, then lay 75 eggs and then walk to the beach and never see one of those eggs hatch, ever. Those eggs will hatch, they'll walk to the beach and a lot of them will get eaten by birds before they get to the water. That's not humans. Animals are not, humans are not independent at birth. We are dependent on each other for life. I mean, imagine if a baby was independent at birth as a human. You're in the hospital, you had a baby, baby comes out, mom, hospital bill, I got this, don't worry about it. (laughs) Least I can do. (laughs) Unfortunately, We are dependent on each other, not always our parents, but we are dependent on each other in relationships forever. Why? Because God created us as relational beings in his image. He is a relational God. He's had relationships since, well, he never had a beginning. 
Who do you have a relationship with? The Father had a relationship with the Son. The Son had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had a relationship with the Father. And they were always together from the beginning. There was no beginning for them. They always were. He made us the same way. So if you're struggling, go get help. <laughs> Don't try to do it by yourself. Three very simple things I want to give you. And these very simple things don't, are not meant to trivial, trivialize your issue. Number one, you need to believe about yourself what God believes about you. You need to believe. The devil would have you believe you are no good. The devil would have you believe you are not lovable. The devil would have you believe you are not worthy. You are nothing but trouble. God has a very different view of you. Look what it says in verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 18. When Jesus got into the boat, he who had been deemed possessed begged him that he might be with him. Please be with me. I want to go with you, God. However, Jesus did not permit him but said, go home, tell your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Uh, listen very carefully. I want you to imagine, well, you could use you as an example, or I want you to imagine the biggest troublemaker you know. The biggest, in your mind, loser you know. The biggest always in jail, always stealing, always breaking something, always get caught, you know, the, tr the cops or whatever. I want you to imagine that person and, and he meets God and the day he meets God, God says to him, I want to put you to work for me. I got something for you to do for me. Well, no, he should go to that seminary and he's in, he doesn't even know the Bible. How is he going to do anything for God? And he, 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 he still got cigarettes in his pocket. He, he, can, he gets sick and sick. Okay, okay, I get that, I get that. Just go tell somebody what I, had did, what I did for you. That's it. Here's a, think about what he said. Think about it. He goes into town, I don't know what clothes he got because he was naked, someone gave him clothes or he had rags or whatever, and he goes into town and says, and they're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, hey, that's that dude. And he's like, no, 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 I'm good. Yeah, 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 get back, man, get back. No, 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 I'm good. I'm saying now, right, don't come near my kids. No, okay, okay, hold up, hold up. I was the one living in the tombs, no doubt. I was the one, I got the shackle, cut marks, because he got scars all over me, cut But guess what had happened? This guy, matter of fact, I, 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 I didn't get his name. I didn't get his name, but he had a beard. He had a beard. He was Middle Eastern. He wasn't from PB. He was from Middle East. <laughs> we got the Hollywood Jesus, then we got the Bible Jesus, okay? Every country you go to, they got, they got a different Jesus. They got a Chinese Jesus. They got a Mexican Jesus. Every country got their own Jesus, right? The brother was from the Middle East. He was Jewish, okay? So he says, he, says, he, was, he, was, he had a beard, and, and, and he prayed for me. And I don't, I'm not crazy anymore. What did God do for you? If you can't tell it, then I doubt he did it. If you can't tell it, what did he do? How, how do you prove? Your best testimony you got, the most powerful testimony you have is what God did to you. I was blind, now I see. I used to curse every day, now I don't. Yeah, you could actually stop cursing. I used to get drunk all the time, now I don't. I used to be addicted to pornography, now I'm not. And by the way, now I'm not. And guess what? He can even erase the images that are in your head. He can do that. And so you have to believe that God has a God wants to use you and God sees you as valuable, a valuable asset in the kingdom of God. You are not just junk. God don't make junk. The devil takes what God made and he tries to convince it that it's junk. And if he convinces you that you're junk, junk if you believe that, that's what you will be. But you have to believe that God says, no, you are a loved, beloved, potential child of mine. Child, I say potential because you're not a child just because you were born in America. Child of God. You're a child of God because you've been born again. Someone comes to my house and says, hey, dad, dad, how you doing? I'm your fourth child. I'm like, brother, I don't know Billie Jean. I don't know who you are. 
no, 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 Dad, you know, I'm your son. I was like, okay, prove it. Prove it. You go to heaven or you pray to God, God, hey, God, hey, Dad, he's going to say to you, prove it. And the only thing you got is, the only thing you can say is, I got Jesus. God, what he believes about you is that he loves you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You are useful to him. He wants to do something powerful in your life. He wants to help people from the lessons that you learned in your pain. If you have a pen, write this down, write down 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. North County, write it down. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. If you're, writing online, if you're online, write it down. 2 Corinthians 1. And here's what it says. Blessed be the, and, and listen to the word comfort. Everyone say comfort. <clears throat> let's, let's hear a little volume. Say comfort. Fight high. Fight high in two verses. Blessed be the Lord and God, blessed be the Lord and blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may comfort others with the same comfort we have been comforted by. Ha! So, this, this Bible represents your comfort, whether it be a friend, whether it be a new job, whether it be whatever, yeah, health, free from your addiction, whatever it is, this, this book represents that comfort. So you're going through your drama and you need comfort, God comforts you, and you take a bath in it. Oh, God, thank you. Woo, I feel good. I almost didn't make it. Woo, you just rub it all over your body and you feel comfort. Take comfort. And then you take the comfort and you just say, yeah, I don't need that no more. I know I don't need that no more as a double negative. It's not good grammar, but that's what I said. And you, do, you, you know what the Bible says? I comforted you with all comfort that you may comfort someone else with the comfort. How many of you, by a show of hands, God has comforted you? Keep your hands up. God has delivered you. He's blessed you. He freed you from something. Put your hands down. How many of you, don't raise your hand, just think. Because then I'm, gonna, then I'm gonna indict you after. So I don't want you to be indictable publicly. So don't raise your hand. Say don't raise your hand. Okay, so if you raise your hand, it's on you, right? Okay, so how many of you never told anybody? You never shared it with anybody. You never explained it to anybody, what God did to you. Shame. God said, I comforted you, not only for you, but to go spread the word like the demon-possessed man. Go tell people what I did. Instead, some of y'all, some, you got comforted, and then when you saw somebody in the play you were in, you were like, what's wrong with them? You started talking trash. Like you never been there. Like you're above that. Or it was so long ago, you forgot what you got comforted by, and you looked down on these people with no compassion, like you've never been there. It breaks God's heart. And, 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 or I'll say it this way, you got saved whenever you got saved, and your life has no outreach to any hurting people. So therefore, that's what you do. You got saved, and it's me, and it's all about me now. I ain't going to help nobody. Huh. What's up with that? Here's what God says. Uh, I want to use you. Now, getting back to your scapegoat, you gotta, you, your life's jacked up. God says you're valuable to him. God says, I want to use you. You saw the story about Tommy? I promise you there's a whole lot of days, and I'm not guessing. I know this for a fact because I've talked to him a hundred times. He saw Tommy in that video a whole bunch of days. He thought he was worthless. Worthless. If you ever see him in this church, bald white guy, and if you say, just see bald white guy, just go up and say, are you Tommy? <laughs> if he's not, just talk to him anyway. <laughs> but one day you're going to get to him and say, hey man, tell me about what God did in your life. He's going to start beaming and tell you. Number two in your notes. Seek out God-honoring environments. God there's a lot of ways to say that. Seek out, create, spend your time in, only dwell in God honoring environment. What does that mean? Well, let's look at it this way. The demon possessed guy, what did he believe about himself? 
whatever the demons told him, and I promise you it was nothing good. Therefore, where did he end up? Living in the tombs with dead people. He's surrounded by death. Think about what conversations you listen to all day. Gossip, cursing, criticism, negativity. Think about what the music you listen to puts in your head, the TV shows put in your head. Think about how clean, organized your bedroom, your car, your house, your apartment is. Think about the attitudes towards God your friends have. I have, I have conversations with ladies all the time. Pastor Mala, oh, I just need a man. I'm just so, it's so frustrating. I can't ever find a good man. There's no good men out there. So I say, where are you looking? <laughs> well, you know, when we're at the club. <laughs> I'm not saying there's not good men in the club. I'm not saying, you know, but is that it? You're up there with your little mini, mini, mini. And the whole atmosphere is about what? It ain't about, I'm going to find me a godly woman and get married. That's not the atmosphere. That's not the, that's not the mentality. And it's funny, sometimes I'll be in, in a hotel for a wedding or my wife and I are taking a weekend or whatever. And in the, in the hotel, there is a, a, a club or a party going on. And I'll be walking through the lobby. This happened to me right here in uh, San Diego a couple of times. And people in there, and they'll be either drunk or just in um, the Jezebel. The, uh, the, they, they're in the outfit. Everything's hanging out. It's all right here. You know, and they're hey, hey, clicking through the, to the lobby, all done up. And then there I go. I'm like, hey, what's, I, at least I don't, this has happened for a few times it happened, I didn't recognize them, but they, hey, Pastor Miles, and, they, and, they, and it's like this the whole time. <laughs> Doing a tootsie roll as they, <laughs> trying to get it over the, over the thing. Got to get it over, got to wriggle it over. And I'm just like, yeah, what's up? What's up? What are y'all doing? Well, we kind of got the, kind of, you know, just kind of, we here. We here. I'm like, it would have been, been better just walked on by, would have known. Now, go have your fun, right? Just don't dishonor God. But if, if you're in that atmosphere, that atmosphere is, not, is rarely going to produce what this atmosphere is designed to produce. If you're listening to garbage all day, curse words all day, and that's in your head, if you listen to all this, this whatever music that's not God honoring in your head all day, that's what you are going to be. As a man thinks, so is he. Versus saying, you know what? I'm going to clean my house, my apartment. I'm going to clean my car. I'm going to make my bed every day. Seemed like a very simple thing. I'm going to brush my teeth every day. Yo, I want to get a woman. Brush your teeth. <laughs> it's a good start. Those things seem very simple, but God is a God of order. And when you are around order and organization and cleanliness, you think different. You act different. It's a very simple, small step. I don't want to call any of y'all out. I don't want to call any of y'all out. Don't raise your hand. If you raise your hand, that's on you. How many of you don't make your bed every day? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> now, that may be your habit. Cool. I just want to challenge you. Try it for a week and see what happens. And here's what I bet's going to happen. You're going to be... And if you do it over and over again, you're going to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to start doing this right after a few times. And the next thing you know, you're going to walk out the room. And one day you're going to have made your bed and you're going to walk back into the room and it's going to be neat. And you're going to be like, man, I need to clean over here too. Because <laughs> it's got to match the bed. Then I got to organize this. And next thing you know, 
You start to feel not only better about yourself, but you start to be more efficient in your life. You start to be more organized in your life, which is all part of it. Very simple step. And then you say, you know, instead of listening to this music, I'm going to put on some, some music that talks about Jesus. You know, you can actually buy Christian music that has the same songs we sing. There's a thing called iTunes. You can get that on iTunes. You can get it, you can get it on Pandora. You can go to the, you can actually get CDs that have Christian music. I'm being sarcastic, but I'm being sarcastic for a reason. Because sometimes you just don't think to do it. We think, I sing that in church. Number three. Exchange your bad habit for a good habit. That sounds like a, a simple thing. Here I am, I'm living a self-destructive life because that's all I am, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to go to church and then I'm going to go back. You know what? Read your Bible every day. Just make it a habit. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray every day. Instead of cutting myself, I'm going to bandage myself up. Instead of crying out in the tombs, I'm going to cry out to God. Instead of running around naked, <laughs> I'm going to get dressed. <laughs> Instead of listening to this kind of music, I'm listening to worship music. Instead of hanging out with these people who all they do is just gossip, curse, and, and I, you know I love them too, but I, I got I to gotta get new friends. We have community groups right here in the church. Sign up for a community group. People start, well, the church is too big, I don't know anybody. That's why we have community groups. It's just an excuse. All you got to do is sign up, go online, it's in the bulletin. There's one in your zip code, most potentially. There's 183 zip codes in San Diego County. We have uh, three, 400, 500 small uh, community groups. Go on. Okay, just say, I'm going to start doing things right. Now, you may have this bigger issue internally, fine, but you're going to deal with it by taking baby steps. And take the baby steps. The first baby step, well, those things. But what we want to do today is give you an opportunity to say, Lord, like a demon-possessed man, I'm going to lay my life down at your feet. I want you to do for me what you did for the guy in the Bible. I want your peace. I want you to forgive me. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to deliver me. Who knows what God will do for you today? Who knows? But at least give him an opportunity to do it. So I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. North County, bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want you to listen very carefully. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you see us as useful. We thank you that you have a plan to use us way better than we can ever ask or imagine. I thank you for all the changed lives that I've seen that you've given me the privilege of seeing you do and if today as you listen to my voice you want Jesus in your life you want him to do something radical in your life I want you to pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart a simple prayer of confession Pray, dear God, I believe you love me. And I know you have a plan for my life. Jesus, please forgive me. Please come live in my heart. 
I surrender my life to you. I surrender my pain to you. Set me free. Please, God. Thank you for being a God of love and patience. The God of another chance. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand up if you prayed that prayer. By standing up, you are resurrecting into a new life. And you are also acknowledging that, G, that you're not worried about what anybody's going to think. That's part of your new person. Is that now it's between you and God. So eyes closed, heads bowed, even in North County. Right now, if you prayed that prayer in North County here in Point Loma, just stand to your feet. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. If you're watching online, please let us know on your screen. There should be a box there for you to click. God bless you. Stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. We see you in the balcony as well. God bless you. God bless you. Stay standing. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Good. 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 Anybody else? God bless you. Very good. Now in a minute, we're going to ask you to come forward. God bless you. Very good. We see you. God bless you. In a minute, we're going to ask you to come forward. If you're in the balcony, all you have to do is turn around and walk up, and the ushers will bring you down. So right now, if you're standing up, come up out of your seat. Come on down to the altar, and let's give them a hand as they come on down. Here's the truth, that God don't make junk. And the devil takes what God intended for good and he turns it to evil, then God says, I'm going to take it back. And God takes what the devil meant for evil and he turns it to good. And God has a good plan. There are times in all of our lives, and I say all, I can't speak for all of them, but I think they would agree, and I definitely can speak for myself, where you feel like it's all lost. Let's give these people a hand. Amen. There's times in our lives where we feel like the burden is too heavy to carry. And please understand you are not alone. I feel that on a regular basis, the burden is way too heavy to carry. 
No one is exempt from that. But the good thing is that God uses that to get us to trust him and to bring us through it. And remember when he comforts us with that comfort, we now know we can take on the next battle and we can also help someone else. So even though this time you feel alone, you feel overwhelmed, God says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. and I'm never going to overwhelm you with what's going to crush you. You have to trust him. So we want to help you do that. We're going to pray for you. Then we're going to lead you into a room. I'm going to ask all of y'all not to leave until we get them in that room. We want to encourage them. And I want to encourage all of you. We have community groups that meet in homes, small groups. You get to know people. If you're just going to come and sit in a room every other week or whatever, you're going to miss out on really all that God has for you. So I want to encourage you, get in the bulletin, go online, sign up for a small group. If you're in a small group, a community group, invite your friends. Invite people who you, your friends. If you're a leader, go out and recruit leaders. We we can't have enough of them, okay? And so we're going to pray for all of y'all, and then we're going to lead y'all into a room over there and some really really nice people in the room. It's going to be good. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for these people. Thank you that you love them. Thank you. Thank you for hope. Thank you for hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take a right turn and walk this way. Let's walk this way.